I'm Julia Summers. I'm the executive director of the New Jersey Highlands Coalition. I am thrilled to be able to introduce you to Joseph Getz. Um, Joe is present making doing a workshop on sustainable local economic development, uh, creating economic growth that respects community heritage and the environment. Um, I'm going to share with you that Joe has spent over 25 years helping communities large and small develop strategies for revitalization and economic growth. He has created marketing campaigns and strategic plans for shopping malls, retailers, real estate developers, and consumer products companies. He developed the company's principal product, Community Insights, an economic analysis strategic recommendation process for revitalization. He conceived and executed a regional economic planning analysis for the communities of Gloucester, Gloucester County, at least where I come from, it would be Gloucester, it might be Gloucester, right. uh, New Jersey. Joe has served as counsel on economic revitalization to Main Street, New Jersey and Main Street, Delaware. He has provided instructional sessions for the National Trust for Historic Preservation, Local Initiative Support Corporation, and the New Jersey Downtown Revitalization and Management Institute, none of which have short names. And he has served on the Technical Advisory Committee of the New Jersey Highlands Council for Economic Development Issues. He has been a featured speaker at regional and national conferences where he shares his insights on destination marketing and stimulating economic growth in downtowns. So the way this is going to work, Mark will make his presentation. People are welcome to put their questions as we go along into the chat. Mark will be, Joe will be presenting a series of slides. And if you have a question associated with a particular slide, you will note in the top right hand of each slide, a small number. So you can actually refer to that page number with your question if you choose. Um, we are delighted again to have Joe here and I am going to turn the show over to him. Welcome, Joe. Thank you, Julie. Uh, let me begin with um, just saying, first off, I'm, I'm thrilled to be here. Uh, and I appreciate the opportunity to, as my wife would say, pontificate to others. Um, but I just want to share with you thinking about uh, economic development, particularly in Highlands communities, because I think having come from the development side, from the revitalization side, it's something that people oftentimes look, as a look at as a challenge. And uh, hopefully today's presentation will, will help you uh, understand that in fact it's not the the Highlands Council is I'm sure everyone knows this part uh, but Mark Lobauer my partner asked me to make sure I say it that that the Highlands Council is really a regional well, regional planning agency uh, and its goal is to create and adopt a regional master plan with the purpose of protecting and more importantly embracing the natural resources um, Although it only covers 13% of the state's land area, it's responsible for providing water for about half of the, all New Jersey rest, uh, residents. The Highlands really is challenged in that it suffers from a loss of natural areas and farmlands that are being developed at a pace of about 3,000 acres a year. Uh, and we're going to talk about some of that sprawl development as we go forward here. The New Jersey Highlands Coalition, although it's not a government agency, it is a wonderful, wonderful, wonderful and valuable and necessary organization that really deserves our support. They work to protect, enhance and promote both the natural and cultural resources of the New Jersey Highlands. And we're going to talk a lot about cultural resources as well today. Um, my goal is to address that misperception that I stated at the onset, that economic growth is incompatible with uh, natural preservation in the highlands, and to show you how sustainable economic development can work. The, um, in fact, when done correctly, sustainable economic growth in communities provides a foundation for supporting the natural preservation of the highlands. Uh, sustainable economic development, and again, I keep using the phrase, phrase sustainable, 
it actually benefits the highlands because it can provide access to natural areas. And as I said, remember that the goal was not just to protect those areas, but to also enhance them and, and share them with people. It can um, enhance the quality of life for people who live there, the residents there. And, and I also think it's important that Sustainable economic development can actually help reduce car travel and emissions, because if we bring the stores, the restaurants, the things that people want and need closer to them, then we reduce the number of miles that they have to travel to go and get those. And therefore, uh, that reduces the amount of emissions and things like that. The Highlands Council, contrary again to that myth that they uh, are, that development is not compatible. The Highlands Council actually offers a grant program uh, for sustainable economic development. And it includes, among other tasks, downtown revitalization is an acceptable component of that grant. So I wanted to make that clear to you because the town we're going to talk about today is Bloomingdale, the borough of Bloomingdale. It's in Passaic County. It's a river community, and it took advantage of that specific Highlands grant that we're going to discuss. Um, the blue line you're looking at here, this is this is actually uh, Bloomingdale. And I don't know if you can see, can you see my little arrow there? The white line is the commercial corridor, and the blue line is the Pequonic River. Um, like a lot of communities, Bloomingdale grew up along the river. It was probably uh, the Main Street may have been a footpath at one point that developed into uh, some sort of a trail and so on and so forth. But the fact is that it aligns with the river. But as the local economy grew, Bloomingdale uh, business development turned its back on the river. And I guess you know, we're, we're coming through time and cars are now the, the primary or vehicles are the primary mode of transportation, not anything on the river. And so the development grows up and faces the road, which in this case puts its back to the river. Even worse, this is a, an aerial photograph of one section of Main Street in Bloomingdale. The, um, the river at the back, at the top here, you can see it's marked Pequonic River. What it now has is an afterthought. As the development created, you can see the rooftops of the buildings here as the development uh, moved forward and grew. They kept pushing the parking back behind the buildings so that now the river, instead of being celebrated and the river, instead of being uh, having access, has now become an afterthought. And what was once a natural resource now sits neglected. The only thing, in fact, that really gets here is the runoff from the parking lots and the contamination, which is really a pretty sad way to, to approach it. Uh, we worked in this particular case with New Jersey Future uh, using the Highlands grant that we discussed, and the plan was to create a sustainable economic growth plan. And I need to explain what sustainable economic growth is. Um, we've worked in a few hundred communities in like 19 different states over the last 25 years. And people kind of throw around the term sustainable, but they don't really mean it when they say it. They, they kind of use it as a crutch sometimes. Sustainable economic development is what happens, and it only happens, when consumer preferences, economic opportunity, and physical conditions intersect. In essence, if we know what people want, and we understand that the market uh, needs it and the environment will support it, then we can have sustainable economic development. And it's really important in this case, particularly in the highlands, because what often happens is an economic opportunity presents itself and a developer or a builder or someone else will come along and try and push that through. And they, they push it through at the risk that consumers may or may not want to support it. And they push it through uh, trying to hinder uh, what the environment really needs done. So sustainable economic development, it begins with three parts in the lower left hand corner. This is the consumer preferences part. What do uh, what do people want? And instead of fighting 
people to convince them that they want to buy what we want to sell them. This approach says, let's begin by going into a community, respecting the culture that exists within the community and creating equity for everyone in the community by asking them what to, what do they want? Um, in this case, we speak with stakeholders, we speak with business owners, property owners, and of course, consumers of every um, of every makeup, whether they are a resident or whether they are not, we want to hear what they have to say. And in the absence of that, I understand people can get frustrated when someone comes into their town with a development idea and assumes that they, the development uh, concept, knows more about the community than what the residents and the consumers who uh, use it know. So we do a thing uh, with a survey. It's an online survey. There are printed versions available. All of these little yellow signs were put in stores and restaurants all up and down the streets. And then that banner, whoops, I went too far. That banner um, actually hung across Main Street. It was something like, um, uh, I don't know, 50 feet wide or something and four feet tall and helped people to know that we wanted them to go to the website where they could take the survey. Um, if you've ever been to Bloomingdale, then you know that Bloomingdale is not is not a downtown in the way it exists today. It's actually just a road with a bunch of stores and businesses littered across the path. It kind of grew up organically over the years. Um, you don't really get a sense of place there. You don't necessarily know when you've arrived. And if you're driving along Main Street from one end to the other, you don't necessarily know when you've left. But when we asked people what they wanted, what they told us was that they wanted all of the things that appear in a traditional downtown. Um, and again, remember that we're speaking with consumers, whether they live there, they work there, whether they're just driving down Main Street, um, you do not need to be a resident as a requirement to take the survey. In fact, we really need to hear a lot more. We need to hear from a larger group than just residents. So this is what we found out when we did the consumer preferences. They wanted more stores and more restaurants. The businesses said, oh, we want more shoppers. Everybody said they wanted more dining. They wanted more entertaining meaning they wanted to celebrate the outdoors, which is important in a place like the Highlands. And the kinds of stores that they told us about that they wanted were all of those traditional uh, neighborhood shopping district stores, seafood and butchers and fruits and specialty foods and bakeries and things like that. Uh, it's important to keep in mind those types of stores, because you'll see this come up a little bit later on, a, on another slide, but bakery, butcher, uh, seafood, those kinds of things. The other thing we, we asked them about, because the surveys aren't just about who are you or how often do you visit, the surveys are really about what do you want. And when we say, what do you want? We don't just mean grocery items or clothing or any of those sorts of things. We ask them questions about tying the environment and, and the uh, green spaces there to the community. And what they told us in this case was that they want to be able to bike and walk and hike in the area, that they think that the river and the downtown should be connected to each other, that they would like to sit along the riverside and dine if that could be done, and that they certainly wanted outdoor events and recreation, uh, things like movies in the park and music in the park. And that's really important because what I'm just explaining on this slide and this slide, that's how you respect people's heritage. You come there, you ask them what they want, and then you give credit to it and, and you follow it. Number two is understanding the physical environment. So we look at the physical environment and the first thing we know about Bloomingdale is there are a lot of properties that are in need of redevelopment. Um, there's a, a bunch of them in here. There's some down this end. There's a bunch scattered along here. There's a whole bunch down here on both sides of the road. So there's a pretty widespread uh, area that has properties in need of, of redevelopment. The challenge to that is, um, 
as I said before, that those properties don't really create a downtown. They're a, it's a road. Main Street is a road coming from one end here and continuing up where it actually becomes called ha Hamburg Turnpike. Um, on the left edge of this picture, there's a road coming down off the left side, and that's called Main Street and goes down into Butler. But the point is that the structures that are there don't really create a downtown. A downtown requires a center, requires a sense of place. It requires um, um, it requires an understanding that you're you're in a in an area, in a specific area, not just driving along the road. So the dotted line outlines the commercial corridors um, that we looked at, and <clears throat> the purple here and the yellow, this is the 100-year flood zone, this is a 500-year uh, flood zone. So if you think about where the commercial corridor is, if you look at the backs of all of these properties here, and in many cases, the fronts of these properties, it was something like 98% of the properties along the south side of Main Street were impacted by the flood zone. On the north side, there's a uh, 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 severe, the steep slopes run basically from uh, Main Street, that would be northeast right through the top of the town. So you end up in a position where you need to do a lot of redevelopment. Um, there's a lot of flood zones there. There's some some uh, steep slopes there that further hinder it. And you come to the conclusion that, geez, this really isn't the right place to put a downtown. But someday someone put it there and here it is. So we're going to have to deal with it. Um, and more importantly, as I said before, this is just the opposite view of an earlier photograph I showed you. The downtown has turned its back on the river. It's created a sea of asphalt that causes runoff and contamination can flow into the river here. And um, the, what was surprising was when we did the study, all the businesses in town told us that they needed more parking. But yet when we look at this, we just see this sea of asphalt back here um, that doesn't do much to to help the environment and um it looks like again i don't know this i wasn't here when this happens but it looks like what may have happened over the years was as the development project came along we kind of bent the rules about the environment a little bit to accommodate the development uh instead of trying to respect it so our goal is to now uh, grow the local economy while protecting the natural resources. So after we went through these two exercises, we now knew what it was that people wanted. And we also knew what it was that we were facing in terms of economic, uh, in terms of environmental uh, issues, which brings us to the third component, which is economics. First off, you have to understand when you go out and talk to consumers, and I know I've said this like two or three times, not all consumers are residents. Um, there's there's people sometimes make the mistake of assuming that if you want to look at the local economy, you measure that by measuring local residents. And that's not true. What we found was that people were coming from as far as 10 miles away up here in West Milford and areas like that to certain stores. They have a oddly enough, they have a reptile uh, store there that so sells exotic pets and reptiles and it, it draws people from all over the place. They also have a number of restaurants that people tend to enjoy. But the point is, they're not just residents. They come from all over the area. So here's Bloomingdale. This is basically I-287. And what we determined from the anal analysis was that most of the people in this gray area tend to come to the south and to the east to shop at shopping centers and other stores, Haskell and and uh, Pompton Lakes and places like that. <clears throat> and that the place where Bloomingdale is drawing its its consumers, what's called the trade area, it's where are you attracting uh, plus or minus 70% of your sales is the area that we're showing here. The other thing that we saw was that all of the things that consumers told us they wanted, the butchers and the bakeries and the and the seafood stores and the <clears throat> uh, fruits and vegetables 
they're all able to be supported. We measure consumer demand. <coughs> Excuse me. So total consumer demand in this shaded red area is about two and a half billion dollars a year. That's how much people are spending on retail goods and services. But the retail supply in that area is less than half of it, which means there's a thing called retail leakage, $1.3 billion in retail leakage. And that means that consumers in this area are leaving this area to spend that money. Now, sometimes it's a, a, you buy a computer or whatever through Amazon. That contributes to that. You go to the theater in New York City. That contributes to it. But when you look at this by category, what we found was 20, uh, $227 million worth of grocery store sales were leaking out of the area, along with $190 million in specialty foods, $132 million in eating and drinking places. So putting that in context, a chain restaurant... Um, a TGI Fridays, a Olive Garden, those kinds of places may have sales, uh, annual retail sales of eight million, nine million dollars. If you divide that into this, you can begin to see the number of restaurants that we could possibly support and sustain in Bloomingdale. So that was the purpose of the economic development, and <clears throat> what it brought us to was this question of how do we create economic growth without damaging the natural environment? And Mark Lobauer has a wonderful saying. He said, always says, the biggest enemy of green space is wasted space. And I thought I would show you this photograph. It's the same one I've shown you three times so now. <clears throat> and that's how you grow the economy. You get rid of the waste, which will create more density. Um, it will there are things we can do, and we're going to explain some of those strategies, but there are things that you can do that allow you to increase density to reduce the need for cars, uh, increase walkability, and start to create retail synergies. So we call it community-driven, not developer-driven. Developers just won't do what needs to happen here. They're a for-profit business. Um, they're, that many of them have a certain model. Uh, a type of project that they build. They build, you know, 20, con uh, 20 unit condos. They build uh, one story retail shopping centers, whatever it is. That's what they're good at. That's what they know how to make money at. This is not necess necessarily the area. So on the left, here's the list. These are all the issues that came out of the analysis that we uh, we did, which looked at, again, consumer preferences, economic opportunities, and the physical conditions. And we came up with certain strategies to create a, a walkable downtown uh, instead of a bunch of random stores to reduce the impact on the environment while enhancing our natural resources uh, and to basically create sustainable economic growth. So there's the list of the different strategies that we used. Um, one of the first ones that we recommended was do the easy ones first. The first thing we want to do is we want to make it easy to get people out of their cars and get them walking up and down the street. So two types of signage do that. Uh, signage that is very uh, noticeable as you're driving down the street. If I'm going 30 miles an hour, I have to be able to read it. This example here on the right tells me which way to go if I want to go to the marina, which way to go if I want to go to the village district. But it's got that little international blue parking that tells me, okay, that's where I want to go. There's an information center. There's a restroom. And I'm not really sure what that is. Um, an anchor for something or other. But the point is, get them out of the car. Once they're not going 30 miles an hour, then it's easier to say to them, if you want to go to the old market square, it's only an eight minute walk. And an eight minute walk is much better than saying it's an undefined amount of time go this way. Uh, these are the kinds of things that can encourage people to walk and to leave the car where it is. So Signage is easy, signage is quick, and signage is cheap, and it's a good thing to begin with. Just don't make it into an art project. It's signage. It has to be readable. It doesn't have to have gold leaf lettering and, and all the things that we see in so many communities. Uh, it just needs to get people out of their car. The next thing we did was we started to look at parking. As I've said before, everybody was telling us, oh, we need more parking. We need more parking. And... Uh, uh, 
New Jersey Future did the parking analysis part. On the bottom is an aerial map of the Main Street corridor, and the orange dots there are where we found private parking uh, lots or spaces. There were 12, over 1,200 of them individually owned. And the problem wasn't that we needed more parking. The problem was that we weren't using the parking correctly. So each of these orange dots represented um, a parking lot. And if you were in this one on the lower left side and you left that store and wanted to go to a store five five buildings away, you had to get in your car and drive up to their parking lot because you know, store number one doesn't want your car sitting there taking up a space while you're in store number five. So we proposed um, that <clears throat> we create a parking management plan. And the parking management plan is basically this. The town takes control, although not necessarily ownership. They take control of the lots. And what they do is they become responsible for providing additional insurance. They become responsible for plowing the snow off of it, for paving it, for striping it, um, for those sorts of things. And this image on the upper end shows you there are seven buildings here, each of whom had their own parking lot, and they also had their own driveway. And in the, the strategy that we recommended, the town would take control of all of this. You would be able to designate certain areas up in here uh, for employee parking and then have areas back along the, the bottom of this for uh, consumer parking. And if you do that, what would happen is you could reduce the number of driveways that intersect on the street from um, seven to two, which would probably reduce the number of accidents so on and so forth but more importantly it would increase the amount of walking that happens because now if i want to visit these stores i don't have to go get in my car and find a new parking spot and so on and so forth while we're on the topic of better parking the other thing that we did we recommended that they uh, that the town require pervious parking in all of the flood zone areas which is we'll go back a few quick slides um, there's the flood zone areas. And if it's purple and it's yellow, and we're saying to them, you have to have pervious parking in that area. In this slide, in this example, all of this paved surface here would be replaced with pavers. Uh, the pavers would allow the water to, to uh, uh, run down, infiltrate into the ground instead of having runoff that's going into the river. And you can see from the examples uh, this is why it allows so much water to come through, because the, per the pavers aren't solid surfaces. There are basically two types shown here. In this, this type in the upper uh, left photo and the middle photo on the bottom, those are grids that are put on the ground and then filled with some sort of an aggregate. And uh, these are using colored space, uh, colored pavers uh, to actually mark the spaces out here, they're just painting right onto the pavers. But the point is, um, no one wants to do this. They want to do it the easy way. But if the town actually has control of the parking, it's a public function the town can provide for the capital to do that. And these pavers, uh, they're typically cheaper than doing concrete, and they last longer than asphalt. So they're more expensive than asphalt, but they last longer. They're cheaper con than concrete, but they may not last as long as uh, concrete. But they're an excellent way to reduce the amount of runoff that's happening. And our recommendation was that in any area that was in that flood zone, uh, whenever they wanted to make any change to the property or do new development, that they had to convert it from impervious to pervious parking. We also made recommendations for um, creating a center of town. So this happens to be an intersection that right now the, the streets are really wide and right directly south of it is Sloan Park, which they've just spent over a million dollars on restoring it and, and um, <clears throat> getting the river back into its banks instead of being overflowed like it had. The building on the upper left, which are represented by these white outlines, uh, that currently is a military recruitment center. Uh, I think there's a place in there that sells kitchen cabinets and there's an auto body repair shop that's back here. Again, 
contamination onto the ground, uh, not the best uses for it. What we proposed was that you create a public market here. This would be a two-story building. The pink area that's surrounding that would be pu would be public plazas. And on the insides of this, these would all be sliding glass walls so you could open them up and bring the outside in and vice versa. And then there would be office space on the second floor, um, which doesn't share parking. The offices need their parking at a time when the stores don't and vice versa. So we can double up uh, here, get two economic uses, one set of parking spaces, which certainly helps uh, pr protect and preserve the natural assets. The building on the right, is a failing grocery store. Uh, it was converted, I don't know, 10 years ago or so out of four or five existing buildings. And because of that, the layout's chopped up and, and it just doesn't work very well. And what we proposed here was that they create uh, in the lower right-hand corner, you recreate that retail and put upscale condos above it. This is a project we worked in in Haddonfield, New Jersey, um, that has just been wildly successful. And what it does is it puts feet on the street um, and it activates these stores. We also put some plazas around here so that what happens is you have a town center, the parks at the bottom, the farm, uh, the public markets at the upper right, upper left. I mean, there's public plaza there. There's public plaza on the left. There's grocery store and specialty retail here. And we've put additional people there. And together that creates new synergies. Uh, not only creating a destination, but also creating economic synergies for people. Not too far from there is this strip of whatever, old house, a garage, a gas station, and some things. And I, I heard this saying one time that I absolutely loved. It was, if you build for cars, you get cars. And if you build for people, you get people. This is what it looks like. This upper photograph is what it looks like when you build for cars. Uh, the lower photos, what we're Dealing with here, the river actually is right behind this with this tree line is where the river is. So we're getting contamination. We're getting runoff. It's all making its way into the river. We're ignoring the natural asset that we have there. Uh, so what we were uh, rec what we recommended to them was that you you take all of this out. The town acquires it all and assembles the parcels because there are multiple owners here and they replace it with townhomes. The townhomes are elevated. It does a number of things. It gets the living space off of what may be brownfield areas. It allows you to put parking underneath these with a rear entrance. The driveway and the parking in the rear is all pervious surface, so we reduce the runoff. We increase the density which of people, which puts more feet on the street to support the stores. And in those areas where the brownfield is just too bad or too expensive to clean up, we can convert it to a park. We worked on a project down in Gloucester County in Glassboro uh, at Rowan, Bull Rowan University and Rowan Boulevard, uh, where we did that, converted an old gas station into a, into a public park. And the cleanup is more affordable at that point. Uh, and what this does is this encourages walking up and down the streets and in parks encourage people to stay and visit. And I will tell you a secret about economics, and that is the longer we can keep you in the store, the more money you're likely to spend. And that translates directly um, uh, that translates directly to the fact that uh, downtowns need to keep people in their downtown. So they'll visit more stores. They'll go to more restaurants. They'll do those kinds of things. Um, this is another example or an example of what happens when it's community driven. What exists right now in this little inset photo in the top, it's a very busy intersection. This is a gas station that has four driveways uh, in and out of it. The yellow here in this larger photo at the top shows you the floodplain and the, the floodplain uh, this little, there's a little tiny circle here. I'm not sure if you can see the arrow and see where that is, but that little tiny circle is where they fill the gas tanks. And so if you're going to have underground gas tanks, it's always good to put them right in the floodplain so they can get full appreciation of the floodwaters. Um, but the point is, it's just bad. It's bad for the community on so many levels. It doesn't do anything to help the environment. It doesn't protect our natural assets. It brings nothing to the party in terms of... Uh, uh, appearance or or uh, <clears throat> any assets, and it also 
is hopefully going to go away on its own eventually as people go more to electric cars or self-driving cars. But the point of this was, in this case, again, the, the town comes in, acquires the parcels, assembles them, cleans them up. These are all good, valid capital improvements for a community. <clears throat> and then they develop the concept that they want and then go out and solicit that from developers. If you look at this top photo with the yellow and you look at the bottom rendering, you'll notice that where there is yellow in here, there is no building. So we, we literally designed a building that would wrap around um, the existing flood, plan, flood areas. There's that little circle that from the fill pipes for the gas tank. This would be uh, a pervious surface parking. Additional parking would be under, underneath on the back uh, at grade on the first level, and then this structure in the front and on top. And what it does is, again, they can be upscale uh, condos that create higher density, that put more feet on the street, that avoids the flood zones, um, that reduces the runoff from the area. And, and that's one of the concepts. A developer is not likely to come and talk about this kind of an idea because it's expensive to do. So therefore, uh, it's something the town can do. <clears throat> this is the same exact scenario. Gas station, flood areas. In this case, we brought the, pro brought the uh, building to the front, created a little plaza, put pervious parking in the back, and perhaps a diner that would be open, you know, late at night and shiny and, and create a gateway. We also recommended a town uh, and river walk. This is a 4,300 square foot river walk that was first proposed in theory uh, back in 2013, but nothing's ever been done with it. And we are saying that it needs to happen. You need to tie it in at key retail locations uh, along the corridor, and then you need to promote it with signage and, uh, and let people know that it's there so that they can actually enjoy that natural asset. Uh, farther down, again, here's, here's this area here in the lower right. And down on that end, what we have is about 135,000 square feet of area. 83% of it sits in a flood zone right now. And what we recommended was that they get rid of that, that we acquire that, and that we create uh, 2.1 acres of green space and up in front where we can, where the floodplain is not present, uh, we can build a narrow, long building. And here's an example of what something could look like that would be um, <clears throat> a festival retail and then put a boardwalk out on the back of it. And you could hold concerts and events here and have a boardwalk that would overlook it. Uh, and then over in this space on the this upper photo, that little space, that would become pervious parking for 68 cars, which would probably reduce the existing parking by two thirds right now, which most of it's unused. Um, and then finally creating their dining destination. We had talked about rebuilding, redeveloping one of their core intersections. If you can see the buildings in the back and the cars, bring everything up to the street line, put your restaurants, uh, in this case, outdoor dining, which means it's outside, but it's on the owner's property sidewalk dining which means it's in the the right-of-way area uh, and then of course riverside dining these little red dots are those umbrellas that you see and the point of it was if you cluster all these restaurants together you begin to create a billboard uh, for the community people drive along and they see what's happening and we can start to take advantage of these views and access to the riverfront which again right now is ignored so the point of all this is uh, growth by choice, not by chance. Uh, if you sit around and wait to see who's going to come in with an idea, you may or may not ever get what it is that you want for your community. And uh, in this case, in Bloomingdale, after we made all of the recommendations, many of which we've shown you here, <coughs> excuse me, this is what would, would actually transform a lot of the rundown and neglected buildings that are there and would reactivate the waterfront the riverfront uh, and tie it back into the downtown and give people in addition to the Sloan Park area there would now could now be this new larger venue this one could hold up to about 450 people depending upon the kind of event um, 
I'm sorry, I'm racing through. What kind of questions do we have here? So, um, Joe, I, we do have a couple of questions. We have we have plenty of time for questions, uh, so you don't have to race. Um, okay. One of them looks to me like a difficult question, so I'll start with that. If the, if you're up for it, yes. Okay. From my colleague Elliot Ruger, he says, "I heard no mention that Bloomingdale is challenged by host being host to two massive crushed stone quarries." with unavoidable adverse visual and physical impacts, blasting, dust, multi-ton trucks, et cetera, that sit between the interstate and access to downtown. How do these land uses limit the compatible economic development of the community? Um, so first off, let me apologize to Elliot by giving him a terrible answer. And the terrible answer is that the area we studied sits to the west of the, of the quarry. So the, they don't necessarily, uh, one doesn't impact the other in the sense that they're, they're two distinct things. And I believe most of the traffic for the quarry tends to go east onto 287 rather than if the, there's no need to come down Main Street because it's a, 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 just a connection of small uh, streets that don't really connect to, to major areas. So I'm, I'm sorry, I know that's not a good answer. In a more in a more, um, uh, <clears throat> I don't know what the word I'm groping for, but but in a more abstract sense, um, I had heard discussions that there were plans for taking the quarry and converting it into single family homes, which raises the question of, of I'm not sure which one hurts us more. Um, you know, I, I, I don't know that answer, but again, I apologize, Elliot, because we really didn't study the quarry um, our study area started to the west of that, and there was no need for us to become really familiar with it. So I apologize. Fair enough. Um, so I've got a couple more questions, um, but I encourage people to put their questions in the chat um, while we have the opportunity. Um, uh, Joe, uh, I have to admit that I'm a big fan of Bill Bryson, who has written many books about this country and others. And one of the things that he hates is that people are really bad about getting out of their cars. Uh, they will drive, you know, 500 feet from one store to the next store. How do we persuade people? You have, you have talked to this, but how are you sure that we'll be able to get people out of their cars and on their feet? Well, I'm never sure of that. Um, you know, we... I started my career doing um, marketing and, and consumer research for shopping malls. And one of the things that I learned about shopping malls was that they put anchors at each end. And my job is to figure out how to get the people to go from one anchor at one end past all the inline stores, you know, to the other end. Um, <clears throat> and a lot of it has to do with appeal. A lot of it has to do with signage. If you make it difficult for them to go that 500 feet, they're all going to get in their cars. Um, so you have to make it incredibly easy. I was involved in a study one time with a with a shopping center where they spent millions of dollars to decide what type of flooring to put throughout the common areas of the mall because they wanted flooring that would be comfortable on the foot. And, and believe it or not, different types do different things. And that's one of the ways you do it. Food courts were an invention of getting people to move from one location to another while staying in the building. And if you take a shopping mall and you just, you know, keep magnifying it up until it becomes a main street, um, <clears throat> the same thing applies. Creating a town center across the street from Sloan Park uh, gets people, there's no need for people to get in a car because we put proper crosswalks and lighting and things. And it's easy to leave the movie in the park and go to the, the event, you know, the stores and ice cream shops and whatever that are across the street. The other way that you do it is you, you uh, take two steps. You make sure that you have the things that people want. So they'll come there in the first place. And then you make it prohibitively expensive or difficult for them to get in their car to go elsewhere. We, we literally have to make it harder to do the wrong thing than it is to do the right thing. So when we worked on the Rowan Boulevard project down in, in Glassboro, um, I fought, I didn't win this fight, but I fought to have parking 
at rates of like six and seven dollars an hour in the parking meters meters that were directly in front of the stores and restaurants and then progressively less expensive until you got all the way to the last row of parking which was basically free for all the merchants so um you need to make it easy for them to do the right thing and then the other thing is you need to get rid of the obstacles like <clears throat> you can't have um you can't have merchants taking all the parking spots in front of the building and then expecting that people are, are not going to go seek a better parking spot because they can't want to get to that building but it's not easy you can't have buildings that don't have blade signs those signs that stick out perpendicular from the front of it <clears throat> because if you stand at uh if you stand at one end of the block and you're looking down and there's no signage to tell you what's down there then there's no encouragement for you to walk down the street to explore but if there is appealing signage if there are uh displays out front which lots of towns ban because the, for whatever reason they think it interferes with people on the sidewalk but when you have no signs you have no parking you have no no displays outside there's not going to be any people on the sidewalk anyway but you know, so it's getting rid of all of those obstacles. Um, will we win the battle? No, but will we lose it more slowly? Probably. So. So we're looking at a lovely photograph uh, of a, an autumnal scene on a lake somewhere with the boats in front. Do you have recommendations of how we can make the river the focus by, you know? reintroducing people to the river i mean that is a beautiful scene who wouldn't want to be uh, out on the river that's that's yeah that's star lake i apologize that's a lake that's on the the western side just just below uh northern state park um the the, the way i think you do it is um i'm going to go backwards not because you mentioned that but i'll go back to this slide here uh joy <clears throat> i they've told us they want to dine riverside and and they've told us that they want a, uh, a you know a river walk, and that they <clears throat> want some recreation areas, and I think one of the things that I've learned in working in communities for as long as I have um, is crawl, walk, run. So right now, what we're doing is we're sending runoff to the river. If we can stop that, that's you know a real benefit. If we can then go to intersections where uh, I, I love dining because even post pandemic dining still works uh, even post amazon dining still works you know so if we can introduce dining and uh introduce it outdoors as well as indoors uh then that gets us on the river and i think the way you 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 activate the river is 30 feet at a time 50 feet at a time 100 feet at a time i i think that's how it works um sloan park as i mentioned before was a let me see if i can find that one uh sloan park was was millions of dollars it's this lower image it's uh one acre and it was millions of dollars dollars to fix all the flooding issues as well as do the other things and there are events that take place there and they are well attended to the degree that you can have a well attended event in a one acre park uh, but the problem is people don't just stroll here and they don't just stroll there because the environment around it doesn't encourage them to stroll there. Uh, there are, I think, a few parking spaces out front, but but not very many. So I think that rule holds true for trying to activate any of our open spaces. Um, we have to make it easy to do. We have to take it a step at a time. This river walk concept. It actually comes up just off the top of the photograph photograph on the left and it intersects back with the road. We had hoped to take this all the way up and connect it to some of the other parks that are in there. Um, but it's just too difficult. It, you know, if we if we plan all that as a first swipe, it's going to be millions and millions of dollars and we're going to get shot down. So we went backwards and said, let's not let perfection be the enemy of good let's try and win the battles that we can win right now and then that combined with uh, a boardwalk and you know public space at the far end of it will hopefully encourage people to want to bring it farther thank you so i have one more question uh given the timing of the bloomingdale's receipt of the grant and they're working with you and new jersey future We've had some pretty earth-shaking 
things happen in this country and the world since then. Has the pandemic changed any conclusions you think that you've reached or recommendations that you've made? Um, no, not in this case. Um, and a couple of reasons why. One is this is fairly recent work. Um, we have not yet delivered the final written report to them, although we have made the uh, we've made the presentations and had all the meetings with them. The other thing is you'll note that when we went through this, um, we and we asked people what they wanted. And that's this column here on the left. Uh, no, it's not. It's this column on the left. What they wanted were things that weren't necessarily impacted by the pandemic. Um, they they didn't want grocery. I mean, they didn't want apparel stores and things like that. They didn't want office buildings. They wanted the basics. They wanted basic food. They wanted basic dining, um, things like that. I think demand for outdoor space and outdoor activities has probably increased uh, since the pandemic. And when we even measured in the survey, we, we, we got the grant, we got retained by Bloomingdale, and they asked us to start. And the pandemic hit about two months after we were into it. So we actually stalled the uh, survey. And we sat and we waited for six or eight months. And then if you recall last summer, I think we had that false start, we thought, or last fall. And that was when we launched the survey. We then asked people, <clears throat> um, were they going back to work? Were they now going to work from home? Were they going to? So we had the opportunity to, to get that kind of insight into it. Um, but unfortunately, what we learned was most people didn't know the answers any more than we do. Um, I, I, you know, the, the big conclusion was, gee, I don't know yet. Um, so it didn't really impact it. The things that we've proposed, I think, are pretty basic. I don't mean to be disparaging to Bloomingdale. There are actually a lot of towns like this that our job isn't to make it perfect. Our job is to make it better. And there are so there's so much opportunity uh, to make improvements here that I don't think we're going to get to the point of, of what's happening. The other thing about the one last point about the pandemic, <clears throat> we work in some communities where the number of people who uh, work from home instead of commuting to the office is really increasing. And Bloomingdale is not one of those communities. These people jump on the interstates and go into Manhattan. A lot of them are in the financial business and things like that. It, they, it's not the kind of thing you can do from a spare bedroom. Um, so we don't see that ultimately that impact as much as you might elsewhere. Thanks. We have one more question uh, from Wilma Fry, who's calling in from Massachusetts. Um, uh, oh, Wilma oh. says, in the studies of the flood prone area, do those calculations take into account possible greater impacts due to increasing rain from climate change? Um, <clears throat> I think the answer is probably no. The data that you're looking at here mapped is um, is the most recent data that FEMA had as of about, uh, not FEMA, uh, the EPA had as of about a year ago and that the Highlands had, had as about a year ago. So the, the, the short answer is, um, I don't know how much they've accounted for it, but I can make the example on this page. This is Sloan Park here. Uh, and when we first began this project in 2019, that flood area came all the way out here. But the improvements that they made it at uh, Sloan Park and the, and the river flow and all uh, helped reduce that flood zone in that area. But again, I don't know what future projections they've made. Well, Joe, I want to thank you very, very much indeed. That was a great presentation. Um, uh, one of our trustees who you probably know, John Donahue, uh, sent a very congratulatory note. Great presentation, very comprehensive and enlightening. And I completely agree with that. Thank you so much. I'm hoping that you will be able to share your slides, which we will post on the New Northwest New Jersey Rivers uh, uh, website. Um, and the video recording this presentation will be on the New Jersey Highlands Coalition's YouTube channel. So people will be able to visit again or if they 
were at another workshop, they'll be able to come and visit, or anybody will be able to come and visit. So you will be immortalized on our YouTube channel, Joe. <laughs>